Okay, hey guys, welcome back to the MLS update with me, Mike Rice. Uh, we're looking back at week uh, match day three, uh, an exciting weekend once again. We've got a full house with us today. Uh, we've got Jeremy Rushing um, from up in Minnesota. Jeremy, how are you doing? I'm good, thawing out from Saturday, but I'm good. How are you, Mike? Yeah, really good. Yeah, not having to uh, go through the uh, the snowy <laughs> the snowy weather <laughs> yeah. and thawing out uh, watching those games. I know you, you contacted me. You got to at least watch from the nice warm press box. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Nice warm <laughs> press box area. Um, but honestly, everybody looked like they were having a blast in the stands too. So I was a little bit jealous there. Yeah. Yeah. I saw the uh the snowmen being made in the stands. Absolutely. <laughs> the snow loons, Mike. Snow, snow loons, loons not, not snowmen. <laughs> Alex, slightly different weather down in uh Miami for you. How's uh how's everything going? Good, good. Uh, it was going well until uh, we heard the awful news this morning. But um, other than that, um, yeah, it, it's the weather's great, and um, <laughs> and I'm hanging in there. Oh, good to good to have you, Matt. We've uh, we've got um, who's joining us, uh, who covers St. Louis. Matt, how are we doing? About as well as I could possibly be doing. Uh, excited <laughs> to be in excited to be in MLS. Excited to cover St. Louis City, but never thought this would be happening the way it is. So I'm I'm doing I'm doing all right. Yeah, I mean. Getting you finally got your first home game last weekend. Uh, the fans must have, um, it must have been an incredible atmosphere. Just remind us of the, what it's been like, um, over these opening weekends. Oh, I mean, it, it's so starting the starting the season on the road. I can't, I think everybody kind of had this just big excitement building. You, you get to see your club. I, I was able to go to Austin, so I was able to see that with about 200, 250 or so traveling St. Louis fans. The, the experience was awesome for the first away game, but then. That first home match is something I'll never forget. It is mm. it, one of the most memorable sporting events in St. Louis history, not just St. Louis soccer history. And so to see 22,500 fans in the stadium, to see tens of thousands of fans outside and around the stadium at all the different bars and restaurants in the area, that was that was truly the we've arrived moment. Yeah, um, it's, it's been an incredible, an incredible start, incredible for the fans, but Three wins out of three, um, an exciting way to start. And many, many people tipping you to be struggling in your first year, um, mostly because we don't know what to expect. Um, it's hard to really, it's hard to really gauge from a side when they first step on the pitch as to what, what's going to happen. And it's certainly been completely the opposite so far, hasn't it? And another win this weekend away in Portland. Yeah, and that's that's where I always take those uh, preseason previews and rankings with a grain of salt because yeah. there was always the caveat of we don't know anything about this club. We don't know how they're going to play in MLS. We there's only a handful of players with MLS experience. You know, they so they're supposed to have some talent from abroad, but we don't know how they're going to play in the league. And so it was always because we have nothing to gauge it off of. You know, we're just going to put them as uh, wooden spoon contenders. Mm. But the the exciting thing from St. Louis is without trying to get too much of a homer perspective. We saw about six or seven of these starters last year with City 2 and Next Pro, so we could see them gelling together in addition to having success at that level, which you just hope translates to MLS. But the sheer fact that so many were in the city from their international homes gives it a level of um, hitting the ground running that I don't think any MLS expansion side has ever had yet. Mm. So from our perspective, knowing all of that and, and seeing the system develop, being at practice and seeing how these players are buying into it, not just the internationals who were here last year, but you're talking your Nico Joachini's, your Indiana Vasilevs, Tim Parker's, how they're leading and buying in so hard to the system. And now having seen that start to pay off for three matches is it's special. Yeah. Um, tell me about, obviously you mentioned that Tim Parker coming in um, and the success you've had in um, reaching the finals of MLS Next Pro and his central defensive partner, a uh, central defense partner, uh, Kyle Hebert, or Hybert. Um, <laughs> um, yep. I saw an interesting stat about them before the game, uh, after the first two games. I mean, uh, Tim Parker had as many goals as tackles, uh, according to MLSsoccer.com. One tackle, one goal. Um because of the, just the pure, pure intensiveness of the uh, the midfield and the attack, winning that ball back, the central defenders are making interceptions more than they are making tackles and getting yep. the game going forward. Uh, Heber gets his first goal, and that's, like you just mentioned, that translation from MLS Next Pro into MLS. They've got that bit of cohesiveness that some other expansion teams don't get. And, I mean, it, it must be looking very exciting that they, the, the whole team are on that system and they're understanding how they're playing, and that's what's getting you the success. It is. And those two players in particular coming at from pretty vastly different 
mm -hmm. perspective. So you have Tim Parker, who's an MLS veteran, and he comes in kind of after more or less the down period with Houston. And, and you're, you're paying a lot for him. You know, you, we spent a lot of money. We spent um, some pretty big trade trade uh, allocation to get him. But to see him in the system, more or less, that he thrived in with New York, to see him um, being able to lead this team, he's our vice captain now as well. And mm. so able to able to be that leader, but the way that the game flows are incorporating him, you're, you're spot on that he's not so much attacking players with the ball. He's preventing the ball from arriving in the box. And, you know, we've seen so many headers out of the box from him this season that it's kind of weird to see that as his primary role. In addition to being one of the biggest uh, pass and chance creators from the back line, Kyle Hebert, though. He led the league last year in next pro minutes. He played all but four minutes of that entire season last oh. year. And, and honestly, the fun fact is the reason he got subbed off from, from what we know is that it was his birthday <laughs> and they offered him an MLS contract that night. They announced oh. it like four days later. <laughs> so the only reason he didn't play all every single minute of last year is for that special purpose. And he wasn't supposed to start this year. You know, Joachim mm. Nilsson from Sweden was our starting center back. So he, Kyle Hebert was signed to our knowledge to be more, more or less depth Yeah. and to see him be able to step up as Nilsson's out until the summer with a knee injury, he had knee surgery in December. It's, it's one of those feel good homegrown stories because he went to college. He's a Canadian, but he went to college in Missouri state. So just mm -hmm. a few hours away from St. Louis and, and it, he has so many friends and family that come and see him so many fans in the area and to see him be successful and a, a, a player of the week candidate this week. It's, it's one of those, you know, you call homegrowns in MLS, but he's as much of a homegrown to us as anybody else. And it's special to see him succeed. Yeah, definitely. I think the uh, Canadian fans as well will be very excited to see his development with the uh, aging central defense they have with Stephen Vittori and things like that. It could be, uh, could be quite an exciting year for him now with the opportunity that's just arisen. Yeah, I've seen some uh, speculation about Canadian men's national team, you know, just rumors or talk here and there. And that would be incredible to see him in that conversation. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a great, great start for you guys. And this chat about sort of the energy drink soccer um, that gets played, but uh, they're getting something out of Klaus as well that some of these other, like the New York Red Bulls, for example, don't get out of their strikers at times. And he's been an interesting one. I look back at his career and he hasn't really hit double digit figures in goals for a long time since he was back in Finland. So I really wasn't sure what to expect on his game um, going forward, but he's linking up the play so well and he looks very confident in front of goal. He's linking up play. He's holding back play. He's creating chances. He he's comfortable. And I think that's where it goes back to, because if you look at his career, he's bounced around, he's been on loans. Yeah. He hasn't really had a steady home. And he's spoken to that point here locally in the media multiple times that he's just excited to have buy-in from a team that believes in him and has signed him to a long-term contract. He signed for, for three or four years mm. and, and knowing that he has that home, knowing that he has that, assurance and confidence from the staff and, and in the system that he's played in. Cause he was with us last year as part of that next pro team. He's able to produce at a level that I, I don't think anybody expected him to in MLS. He was, he was one of those two guys, uh, him and Edward Leuven, our other DP who we believed in him because we saw what he was capable of last year in this system. But because of that unknown in MLS, he kind of flew under the radar to mm -hmm. start as a, a DP that was kind of unknown. And he's not a high dollar DP either. So he's uh he's a guy that Lutz knew from the past and, yeah. and there's a history of players on our team that have relationships with Lutz Finnish deal, our sporting director. And that's kind of why they're, they're a part of our team. And, and it's seeming like Lutz has leveraged his relationships and ability to bring in players at cost at a very value-based cost to, to better the entire team. So we're not breaking the bank. We're never going to break the bank as a, as an MLS side. We're not going to be, an Atlanta, uh, uh, an LAFC, uh, New York mm -hmm. City, we're not going to be able to bring in those high dollar guys. Uh, Firmino, possibly with the exception, if if, maybe, <laughs> yeah. if the rumors can hold. <laughs> but, you know, Klaus is that kind of guy where mm -hmm. he he's doing what he's been asked to do. He's facilitating for other players. He's making runs in and out. The goal he scored against Austin to, to start off the season was, was a run down the field where he was able to hold up the ball and kind of just cheekily knock it in. That's the kind of thing that we see him do. He doesn't play as a, an out and out number nine where he's waiting in the box for shots to be delivered to him. And he'll just like a Giroux head at home or something. Mm. He's, he's a guy who's playing with the, with the wingers, with a second striker, if Nico Giochini's in. And, and so the flexibility that that affords 
is one of the things that's leading to a lot of the success we're having now. Yeah, it's been it's been really good. Like it's it's crazy it's crazy to see how well uh, how well they've cohesively joined in such a quick quick space of time, really, and to to step into this league and to make it feel like they're they're a third fourth year sort of side. Really, it's all it's all going pretty impressively and. It's going to be yeah exciting to see how they continue on. Um, let's move across um, uh, a little bit further north up to Minnesota. Like we said, uh, the game in the snow. We watched um, we watched it being scraped off of the pitch while the players warmed up last uh, on uh, Saturday. Uh, yep. Jeremy, a one-one draw uh, with Red Bull. How how did you find the um, how did you find Minnesota's game? It's really tough to really take mm-hmm. anything of note from a match like that where the conditions are just so extreme on the pitch. I mean, you saw before the match even started in warmups, the players were just sort of kicking the ball about, passing it back and forth. And as the ball was rolling on the pitch, it was accumulating snow. It was like that <laughs> wet, sticky snow. So you knew what it was going to be all match. Long balls, long balls, long balls. Hopefully mm-hmm. somebody can get on the end of it. Hopefully a defender slips. Hopefully something crazy happens and you get a goal-scoring opportunity. Um, and both goals obviously came off set pieces. Minnesota's first corner of the year. Uh, hit painter with the goal there so um that was cool to see bongi you know get his goal um adrian Heath said after the match he was really disappointed with the team with the way the team came out after halftime i'm um, conceding that that set piece goal mm-hmm. so early in the second half that equalizer um so in that sense it does feel a little bit like two points lost because they just took their eye off the ball for a minute uh in set piece defense which has been kind of a reoccurring issue with this team both last year and early in this season so that's something to keep an eye on moving forward um if they can sort of withstand that but in terms of big takeaways big observations big things moving forward is just such an extreme environment i will say both coaches after the match did express a lot of frustration with the amount of snow that was left on the pitch um and and at, at first i was kind of I kind of just tossed those comments to the side. I thought maybe they're just both kind of of frustrated a little bit with the result. But looking back at actually the snow accumulation in Minnesota, not to get too, you know, weather guy (laughs) here, but there really wasn't a lot from like lunchtime until the start of the match. There was maybe only an inch or two from that point on. A lot of the snow fell the night before that morning. So in that sense, you know, it does seem like there could have maybe been a more sense of urgency with the grounds crew, whoever's in charge of that, to try to clear the pitch, you know, a a little bit better for Mm -hmm. the start of the match to make sure there wasn't so much snow. Because you actually saw your the best soccer being played on both sides and Minnesota's best chances in the run of play coming later on in the match after a lot of that snow had sort of melted and drained through the pitch. The players were able to find their footing. There were far more chances. It was far more exciting over the last 10 or 15 minutes. You just think maybe if they were able to clear that snow before the match at halftime, you know, a little bit earlier, yeah. we could have gotten a little bit better game out of it. And uh, both teams could have gotten a little better crack at getting three points. Yeah, it's um, it's really hard one to tell. And for, for you guys, uh, it's only your second game you had last weekend um, without a match. So yeah, the week still... two bye. Yeah, a nice early break for you guys. Um, yep. is there, I guess it's kind of hard still getting a gauge on what this team's going to be um, going forward. Um, yep. Let's say not not really working out who the striker's going to be as well. Garcia got, did he get the start again, didn't he, this weekend? Um, yeah, over he did. Maria. Um, but I, I guess it's still you're not really too sure what you're gonna what you're getting out of this team yet. Yeah, at this point, I feel like the striker is just gonna be a question mark for Minnesota United forever mm-hmm. and ever, amen. Because it's just <laughs> been that way since they've entered MLS. There's never really been a true number nine that you say, okay, this is the guy who's gonna kind of take the ball and score 15 plus goals and give us that best chance. Um, I will say though, you we we kind of started to see this team begin to develop an identity without Emmanuel Reynoso. It's very defensively focused, defensively minded. You see the, you see the wingers playing on the defensive half of the, of the midline more often than they don't. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's this Mender Garcia up top, really back pressing on defense. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully he can get on the end of a long through ball or a long, uh, a long ball to try to generate a chance. And uh, Minnesota really is defensively focused right now. Um, packing it in and trying to hit on the counter whenever they can. And that is going to be this team's identity without Reynoso. But I think one of the encouraging things is you, know, you have two goals in two matches. You have four points out of two matches. And so that identity is, at least at some level, 
is starting to look like a successful one. Maybe it's a successful game plan for Adrian Heath. Maybe it's something that might be sustainable for this team over the long term if Emmanuel Reynoso is going to be out for, you know, two, three months, if not longer. So there is a sense of encouragement there. Um, I'm really interested to see how they go on the road and do against Colorado. I think Colorado is very vulnerable uh, Mm -hmm. right now and a team that, you know, Minnesota could potentially get another three points on the road against if they play up to their, up to their potential. But yeah, you're right, Mike, there are still a lot of question marks, especially in the attack, but it seems like this team is not going to be necessarily focused too much on the attack, just trying to take advantage of any counter opportunities they get and, you know, try to keep clean sheets, I think is going to be what, uh, what Adrian Heath strives for. Yeah, that's, I mean, like we're saying, it's, we've, we're we're also not there, um, looking into these games, seeing how, how are they, how are Minnesota going to approach them? Like we said, um, in the snow uh, this weekend, it's not going to be his game anyway, in some yeah, ways, so exactly. it's hard to tell, but what, how are you finding the center of midfield, the players that are now being used in that area and the rotations they're using there and the way they're set up, Do, is there a confidence in that, in that midfield? Yeah, and I think that's what brings confidence in kind of this game plan and the identity is the way the central midfield and the back line have played through two matches so far. Um, you, you saw guys like Mickey Tapias really struggle in the snow. I, it had to be his first time ever <laughs> yeah. playing in the snow, probably. <laughs> uh, but, you know, guys like Kervin Arriaga and Will Trapp, and, and I, you know, I got to give a huge kudos to Will Trapp, had a really scary rib injury um during the bye week where he actually had fl- some inflammation around like vital organs around his oh, ribs. Wow um turned out he was able to kind of recover from that in a way that was you know he was able to start on saturday yeah. and i have to imagine i'll you know we'll ask him this week we didn't get a chance to talk to him after the match you know i have to imagine he's probably in some level of pain still yeah from that so to play you know basically almost a full 90 uh with that and then uh, alongside him curvin ariaga has been the player of the season so far through these two matches for minnesota um he has just been absolutely immense in central midfield you know given given how tough the conditions were on saturday um you saw minnesota united as a team i don't know if you saw matthew doyle's piece for mls soccer.com this morning but minnesota's 48 <laughs> sub 48 percent pass pass completion percentage on saturday is the lowest ever recorded <laughs> in an mls match um curvin ariaga his pass completion percentage on saturday was 73 percent. so he <laughs> was still fantastic even with the conditions and, you know, he, he won nearly all of his aerial duels, all of his ground duels, just making excellent slide challenges, really timing his challenge as well, turning possession over. Um, he has been incredible for this team so far. And then I think the new center back pairing of Mick Tapias and Michael Boxall, you know, Boxall being the veteran, Tapias being the new guy. Um, I thought they have done pretty well, uh, all things considered, through two matches as well. So, on you know, in the, in the defensive half, there's a lot to be optimistic about. It's just a matter of can they get enough goals mm. to get the results they need to get themselves in that to keep themselves in that playoff conversation. Yeah, that's going to be yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that how they can continue to be that sort of counter attacking side, like you say, and will will that be enough? And not conceding a goal so far from open play, um, yep. we'll see. It'll be interesting to see how the defense continues in that manner, um, uh, especially on the road going to Colorado next week, like you mentioned. Let's move across down to uh, down to Miami, who got their uh, first defeat of the season on their first road trip. Alex, um, first game outside of the state, um, not 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 the not the result you would have been hoping for. Um, what what? How did you find uh, Miami's performance against uh, New York? Um, better than they were last season, honestly. Mm. Um, it was really. I don't think that one own goal really was spoiled the match for Miami essentially I think that if that didn't go in I think they probably would have walked off with a 0-0 draw and um yeah I think the entire game is just unfortunate because you know we got the news this morning that Gregory is going to be out for the foreseeable future due to a nasty tackle uh from ex-Miami player Matthias Pellegrini from behind so um yeah just uh when it rains it pours so yeah, unfortunate game, and I don't think they're going to be talking about the loss much. I think it's, you know, now they, they've lost a key player uh, in that team now, and, and now Neville, Phil Neville's going to have to switch things around and um, see who can play that that defensive midfielder role. Likely it'll be Jean Mata. That means Miami will probably play a, a different style of football because, you know, Gregory's not necessarily a ball-progressing uh, midfielder. He's definitely a more defensive style, but John Mata does have that that um, deep line playmaking ability in his pocket. So I think Miami will have to switch it up in that regard. And yeah, it's unfortunate because Gregory got injured, but I, I think 
you know, there are guys that can step up, you know, Bryce Duke, he's been playing as a, a sort of a box to box number eight. Now, you know, Victor Joe's on the bench, a uh, homegrown player, Benjamin Kremeshki, who I'm very high on can maybe step in. Maybe Miami will go out and acquire another player before the window uh, closes. But yeah, the, the game as a whole, um, I, I, you know, I think Miami will just throw it away and, and look towards Toronto. Even Drake Callender said as much in the post-match conference, you know, he they said they don't linger on things like this. It's unfortunate the own goal has happened. You know, McVay will shrug that off and, and yeah, they'll just keep moving forward. But uh, the game as a whole, I think New York City did a good job of plugging the, the middle of the field, which is where Miami wanted to dominate. You saw Pizarro tucking in a lot, uh, Stefanelli trying to find those little half pockets of space, but you know, that field is so small and truncated that they couldn't really play that. <laughs> yeah. That, that Yeah, they couldn't play the style they wanted to. And I'm not, and I'm not using the field as an excuse. It's just how it is. But they couldn't find those little pockets of space, so Miami were forced to be forced to go out wide. And if you look at the um, the heat maps, you know you'll see DeAndre Ed- DeAndre Edlin making a lot of overlapping runs, getting crosses in. You know Joseph Martinez had Joseph Martinez had three uh, really good opportunities that you know just one of them narrowly missed the, the bar. Really, you know he, yeah. he should have scored there. But um, yeah, it's something to build on for Miami. And now with Gregory out, they're gonna have to. Uh, rearrange that central midfield and and maybe they'll have to bring in a player before the the transfer window uh, ends i believe and in april i think the, there's the this, the primary transfer window and then mm-hmm. there's a secondary one so yeah it it, it, it bad game for miami you know mm-hmm. maybe they, they would have walked out with a draw if not the own goal but uh new york city's uh, fc did what they needed to do plug the middle you know their players stepped up um and yeah, I mean, they there there's no excuses with that, and you know they're still in a good position. Two wins, a loss, and they're going away to Toronto, which will be difficult. But and it'll be more difficult with Gregory out. But um, you know Neville will find a way, and it's not the first time Miami's backs have been against the wall <laughs> in their entire club history. So mm. uh, I definitely think they'll they'll just find a way to dig it out. How are you finding um, Joseph Martinez's form coming into this side? I see lots of excitement around his signing sort of on and off the pitch, really, and the, the player that you're bringing in, not just uh, as, as well as the person. Um, he got the start as a lone striker in this one. Um, so how And how did he um, play as, as well as um, new signing Stefanelli got some uh, opportunities in that front line? Was how did you How did you find their sort of partnerships going? Yeah, Joseph played really well, you know, considering the fact that uh, Phil Neville said uh, that he wouldn't be fit for like another uh, two or three weeks. He won a full 90 and, you know, he had his opportunities, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Joseph is only what, 5'9", five, 5'8", five, five, so you can't really, you know, play long balls up to him and, and expect him to win headers. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think when Campana comes back and they switch back to that double striker formation, it'll work a little bit better and, and, and hopefully uh, I think Leo will be fit for the Toronto game as well. So um, hopefully they'll, they'll be able to switch back to that, but yeah, Joseph played well. He had his chances link up play uh, had two, like one really good chance that he should have scored. And I know he he's killing himself that he didn't score. Mm. And um, yeah, I think Miami just couldn't get him on the ball enough uh, to, to, for him to have, you know, at least one more good chance. Stefanelli, he was trying to, to combine and create and, he had one really good through ball that, that Joseph scored, but it was called offside. But I think that's what Miami want. They want Stefanelli getting on the ball, finding those half spaces uh, in between the the midfield line and and uh and and, and in front of the de- defensive line. So just there's like a block of two like in those half spaces, um, trying to 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 you know get through balls in behind a Joseph instead of you know playing long balls up to what they would have been with Campana, and yeah, it it almost worked out, but you know it was called offside, but. Yeah, the two of them, they're they're gelling nicely. I think they're going to have to take a while to actually uh, get their form. I, I think guys like uh, Sergei Kristoff and Franco Negri have adjusted far better mm. uh, than Stefanelli and Joseph have right now. But, you know, we're only four games into the season, and it, it's going to be a long season with a lot of games. So, uh, you know, they'll, they'll find their, their time, and, and they'll continue to gel and only get better with uh, each passing game. And uh, we, we've spoken before about Phil Neville and how he seems to be a great motivator, but tactically sometimes there's there's been questions raised about him and how he can make changes that affect the game. You, uh, what, how how did you find his decision-making from a coach's point of view during that game um, on such a tight, congested pitch, um, the things he was trying to do to change it? And as well as, like, is there confidence in what he's going to do to prepare for his sides going forward without Gregory in the midfield 
Yeah, I think um, it's you know it won't it won't be the first time Miami have played without Gregory, and I I know he's he's usually uh, injury wise he you know he's usually pretty good at staying fit, but um, there are, are times where he you know picks up a yellow card and gets suspended, so Miami's kind of forced to play without him, and um, you know usually Jean Mata takes his role, and I believe um, there was one Atlanta game where Miami played at home without Gregory, and I think they managed to win that two one. I believe I have to double check, but. It's not impossible, and I think uh, the team is prepared for that. It's unfortunate, but you know, it's the cap. It's their captain, and they don't want to see him injured and and out for you know four to six months. And and it's an unfortunate, but yeah. Uh, switching back to Phil Neville, I think there that is a common criticism with him. He's a great man manager. You know, he can you know rile up the troops really well, and 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 you know he's he's great man to man and 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 in that regard but i think tactically sometimes he he does he is lacking a little bit you know he has you know i was talking with a colleague he has a really great you know plan a in in in, in regards to tactics you know so he'll drill his teams with you know uh, one goal in mind and that is plan a and once plan a falls apart like with the NYCFC game like you know that own goal you know it, instead of you know switching to plan b um he just doubles down on his plan on, on on his his first plan and and he just tells them to do it harder instead of switching it up a little bit <laughs> uh, yeah and in and some games it works you know just play harder but other times you have to you know maybe switch up the formation or 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 tell specific players to do something different tactically and you know sometimes he is lacking in that and i think against nycfc it showed i i believe when you know when they went down a goal i i'd have to double check the you know the the box listings but i think he he took off Corton Jean, which I, I don't I didn't think it was the right move. I thought Coco Jean was playing okay for I think he brought on Bryce Duke and Bryce mm. Duke is a great young player, but you know, right now he I, I in my opinion, I think he's a little bit out of form. You know, his touches were wayward. He he wasn't as clean as he normally is in, in regards to his technical ability and you know, and he was playing more of a, you know, a, like a number ten, but sometimes he's out of position and he's drifting on the wing and you know, you want Bryce Duke centrally to feed balls in behind to Joseph. So, and it didn't quite work out. So I, I thought some of the subs were wrong timing. You know, I, mm. I would have brought in like a Robert Taylor or, or someone who is just more technically sound on the ball and who can then maneuver in those tight spaces. But yeah, I think that's a common thing with Neville. You know, instead of, you know, switching it up tactically, he'll just double down on his plan A and do it harder instead of switching it up. But, you know, he's a great man manager and he can get the troops going, but yeah, you you see the the game. <laughs> yeah, he just should have switched it up. I know I, yeah. I'm not using the field as an excuse or anything, but you know it. it yeah, you got to switch it up when when once it's it's gone like that. But you know it's it's a long season, and one loss isn't like a, a detriment mm. to their playoff hopes or anything. So I think, you know, they'll just keep moving on and 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 uh, focus on Toronto this weekend. Okay, then moving across to last year's MLS Cup champions. Uh, it's, uh, LAFC are making um, pretty easy work of a, a long old trip down to Costa Rica um, in the Champions League uh, to then a nice comfortable 4-0 win at home. Jeremy, is there is there any stopping this team? <laughs> no, and I, I honestly, <laughs> coming in, I thought maybe they were on upset alert this week, LAFC, mm. coming off CCL, you know, but man when you have Dennis Buwanga just pouring in goals, yeah. it's just it's, it's tough to beat this team and um just all around solid and you know they've you know were thought to have maybe some some depth issues early in the season but when you're scoring four goals yeah. uh you know <laughs> you can alleviate <laughs> a lot of those issues so yeah man uh it's just it's crazy to see how lafc is kind of really reloading this year and um uh, maybe even in better form this year than their mls cup run last year yeah i mean there's questions everyone wondering why they let their center forward go go who was scoring so many goals were quite yep. happy for him to leave and but again this game Dennis Buanga getting two more goals um and Tillman and Buke getting on the score sheet as well so they got there they seem to be flowing really well and even without their first choice goalkeeper still recovering from that broken leg um yep. And it's it's just yeah starting incredibly well and I mean they they go to Seattle next week that's going to be uh an incredibly uh incredibly good game I think um looking forward to that but on the other side New England yeah it really wasn't their day but I mean, mm -hmm. Petrovic made about three or four other incredible saves and yep. it's just highlighting how important he is to this team how good he is as a goalkeeper in MLS and they'd be worried about if he leaves in the summer yeah I mean you could you could you know 
honestly, it could have been a touchdown scored mm-hmm. on uh, on New England on this one if it weren't for Petrovich. Eight saves, yeah. but also letting in four goals just the, shows the attacking onslaught that uh, LAFC put on. And mm. uh, yeah, he is, you know, he, Petrovich is, is an interesting story because obviously he is stepping in, uh, you know, for somebody who had just left to go to the premier league. And it seems yeah. like he might be on it himself <laughs> on a similar trajectory. It's just, it's weird. It's like the, you know, the, the meme of the guy from the Simpsons where he walks into the, to the bar, <laughs> yeah, puts it's... his hat down, <laughs> does a circle, picks his hat up and walks right out. That <laughs> might be the, the goalkeeper situation there for new England. But yeah, I mean, he was incredible, but it, it you know, still lets in four goals. It's, it's a weird dynamic. It was a weird game for new England defensively, just not, not really, doing mm-hmm. much of anything in front of Petrovic um, and LAFC just, I think is just a scary matchup for anybody that goes up against them. Whether you're talking MLS or CCL, I don't yeah. think it matters. This team is just on another level right now. Yeah. I was just sort of wondering, will they prioritize certain competitions in the early stages? But no, it just seems like they've got their way of playing and they'll just. Maybe they can just prioritize both at the same time. <laughs> <I> mean, <Yeah. laughs> the way things are going. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, if they're gonna keep going like that, it's gonna be very hard to uh to find ways of beating this team. And but let's move uh across um back over to the east uh, Eastern Conference. The Derby matchup between uh, Charlotte and Atlanta. Um, Matt, it was an incredible day for Caleb Wiley. Um, to <laughs> get straight into this game, uh, two goals and an assist. Um, great performance from the young homegrown. Caleb Wiley reintroducing himself to fans who might have forgotten, but he is he he held his own and I, I have a tough time kind of figuring out whether he's just going to continue with this breakout run if he right place right time against a Charlotte defense that was very vulnerable wasn't looking to really press the ball forward and and kind of Atlanta took part of the opportunity and, and made the most of it but Wiley with an assist and a goal, very impressive. Mm. Yeah, I mean they they were getting a lot out of this from uh, the forward line. Uh, we obviously we know so much about Tiago Almada, but Arujo's had his critics after a huge money signing, bringing the cross from Europe. But he managed to get on the score sheet, and I found at times this season so far he's looked quite um, quite sprightly going forward. He's attacking teams. It's not like um, when you see players um, maybe like Kevin Cabral who started to things weren't going right for them last season and they started shying away from certain things and tried to keep things safe. Aruko seems to continue and they've got this way of playing up front um, and they've got their Greek Giacomakis <laughs> coming in um, who should be um, starting to get some starts soon once he's acclimatized and it's looking like a very dangerous forward line. Yeah, seeing uh, Giacomakis was really exciting to see him come in, but mm. I, I see Arujo and Almeida as very dangerous for this league going forward. Mm. Um, you know, Arujo had five shots, and the one he scored was just a, an unreal strike, hard, hard as can be. And Almeida, the, the chance creation and just the way that he's able to facilitate is is something that it, it's could return Atlanta to glory, honestly. The mm. way that those two are playing and, and with Wiley out left, it's they they took full advantage of a Charlotte team that was clearly um, and has clearly not been ready to compete this year, uh, much to the chagrin mm. of where they ended last year. But this this Atlanta team came out strong and Almeida in particular, I think, is going to do a lot of damage facilitating the ball. Yeah, like you say, on the on the other side there, I mean, Carol Svidersky is moving further and further away from goal. The decisions on the players that they brought in has affected where he's been dangerous last season and was a very dangerous player who went to the world cup with poland you've got a dp striker there or someone who can play as a support striker which he really shined at at the end of the season but he's just moving all over the pitch and not affecting games there's no doubt enzo capetti's talent and and making sense to bring in that that caliber of a player and he's obviously in and of himself a great finisher you know he can Mm. he can work off the ball really well but the way that this team has been constructed is is head scratching. So mm. why why when you find out where Swiderski plays best at the end of last year in MLS, would you take that knowledge and just throw it to the wayside, move him <laughs> as far out right as possible? And yes, against St. Louis, he did have a nice cross in for a goal, but that was it. You know, he mm. really has just been on an island. He's not he's not able to affect the game like he does as that number ten or that second number nine. And, and with Capetti, I just don't think they've found a rhythm yet. And mm. Charlotte, having spent so much money on him, you have to hope that between those two and Joswiak, 
they can find some rhythm because those first three games, nothing's there. No, yeah, it's going to be um, yeah a lot of work needs to go in on their side of how to start getting the best out of their players. Um, but for Atlanta, after so many injuries last season, there was a different one each week. Players were getting moved around. It's one of the reasons Caleb Wiley got so many um, opportunities um, in the first team last year. But they seem to have got players back. Brad Guzan's back in goal. And more importantly, Miles Robinson returning from that long se- uh, season-ending injury last year um, that ruined his World Cup chances. It's great to see him back and playing and looking confident. That's a feel-good story that you can't mm. help but root for. And seeing him as comfortable as he was against Charlotte, I, I'm happy. I'm happy he's there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, great to see. Um, really good to see. And Atlanta looking to be performing well above what we may have expected from them um, going into this season from the kickoff. Um, sticking in the conference then, DC United managed a one all draw with Orlando. Um, Alex, DC had the chance to really take advantage of Orlando's uh, CCL trip in midweek. Um, rotations happened um, across the uh, across the team. But one player who Kept his place, uh, Pedro Gaese. Um, he kept out Benteke um, early on in the game in a point blank save. Made so many, um, so many vital stops. Um, without him, I couldn't imagine Orlando got anything out of this game. Yeah, and Orlando um, again with another draw. You know, obviously they're going to rotate and and you know rest their guys from the from the Concacaf Champions League. Um, yeah, DC they're they're turning along. I I think a lot of people expected them to uh be um, worse off than what they're doing. But you know, you know, getting a draw against Orlando, who you know they were a very good team last year. You know, I don't think it's a decent result for them. And I'm sure Rain, Wayne Rooney will be pleased. And you know, Benteke still uh showing his class and and getting used to the league. And and Pedro Santos and and their team that they're they've been rebuilding. They're they're looking uh better off than I think most people thought they would. You know, Chris Durkin getting the goal. And you know Orlando, you know, still hanging on. They they got that draw, and obviously, like I, you said, they're they're rotating. So, um, you know, Orlando, their depth is pretty insane. You know, still Facuna Torres, mm-hmm. uh, Pereira, it, you know, Schlegel, the Kyle Smith, like the back line still. It it, it I don't know I don't know if they you played you know Kyle Smith as a center back, but but still I think their depth is still very solid. You know, they went out and and, and splurged pretty heavily over the off season and. And you know that's why you 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 do so because you're in playing in multiple competitions and mm. Orlando knew that they're going to get stretched pretty thin and that's why you rotate and, and and that's why you got got the guys you did because um uh you know like I said Concacaf Champions League and the League's Cup I believe uh, later in the year and mm. obviously your your roster with MLS rosters like uh, you know they're not construct you know they're not in a you know they're MLS rosters they're like there's not a lot of room for depth you know yeah. compared to other leagues <laughs> yeah so um. <laughs> that's what I was trying to get at but yeah and that's why Orlando made the moves that they did Duncan McGuire scoring and and yeah it was just a you know typical uh, 1-1 draw Pedro Galese always standing on his head you know just you know a lot of good goalkeeping this this season I feel in in Mm. Florida from uh, both of the Florida teams (laughs) but uh, yeah yeah yeah, uh, decent game and obviously I think with uh, Orlando and their competitions they're going to be you know, pretty okay with the draw. Obviously, they would have liked to get mm. gotten, you know, the win. But um, you know, you get a draw early early in the season, it doesn't like hinder your playoff hopes or anything. So I think uh, both teams would probably take that result. Maybe a win for Orlando. I don't know, but still a decent game overall. Yeah, no, I agree. I think yeah, DC are looking slightly better than I expected. Still not a great team or a finished article by any sense of the imagination, but they seem to have a bit of an idea of what they want to be. And Orlando, they have. I think for the neutral, they're not going to be the prettiest game that you're going to tune into each week, but they seem to be managing their games really well. And defensively, they look really organized in the midfield. They look quite good. It's just, yeah, just not the most exciting going forward. It's it's a very different game to that Atlanta front three um, supporting a striker. Um, let's go over across, um, over across to the West. Uh, Vancouver um, had their CCL um, experience and a huge 5-0 win. Um and got their first uh, good result and their first points uh, in M- MLS against FC Dallas. Uh, a one or draw that wasn't the most exciting game. I think both sides didn't really do enough to win. I think maybe um, maybe Dallas would have expected a little bit more from this. I mean, Jeremy, you saw them in the first game um, of MLS against uh, Minnesota. You traveled down there to see them. This this forward line has so much excitement about it and like some great different types of forwards who can really 
like threat in the defense, but it just doesn't seem to be clicking perfectly um, or, or consistently. So they've had that one game slow, one game great, one game slow is, is, is something that seemed could happen. Yeah, it's it's you know the classic one goal Dallas, right? Mm. I mean that's kind of been their <laughs> been their calling card. They cannot get that second goal somehow. You know for some reason it just seems to escape them, match in and match out, and it costs them results. It costs them points. I mean, um, you know that they, they would have gotten three points out of this one if it weren't for a Paul Ariola own goal. Um, and their only Dallas's only goal came off set piece, came mm. off cross. Uh, their center back and Yegba, uh, you know, with the header for the goal there. So it it really is. An inter- it's a conundrum uh yeah. why dallas can't seem to find that attacking success with just they have some dudes up front you know <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just it's insane it's insane how you know Pereira, velasco you know areola sebastian legit like you know mm-hmm. all, all those names all that talent all that potential firepower and just does not seem to click for yeah. them. um and it hasn't done so yet didn't so last year um and maybe you had the excuse last year that you know uh, a guy like legit came in mid-season and you know the guys were sort of getting getting acquainted maybe getting getting used to the new system under the new coach but you know it seems to be carrying over now into 2023 as well um you know credit for vancouver finishing off a really good week by getting getting that result mm-hmm. um but man yeah the dallas the question marks for dallas i feel like I just keep building yeah, I think um, I've just watched um, Vancouver a bit. The Cordova's come in. He's really not clicking with his side at the moment. So Brian White's getting the chances there. And Ryan Gould's doing very well, creating opportunities. But there's still not not too much going forward for this team. And they seem to not be able to answer questions that are coming up. And I think Fanny Sartini's going to have a difficult time if things don't start improving domestically. I mean, a 5-0 win at home. And CCL's great. Um but the level of the level of performance isn't quite there at the moment, and they don't seem to be able to have an answer for it. Um, let's stick in the conference. Uh, well, uh, in both the East and West, uh, Cincinnati uh, get the win over Seattle. Um, Matt, looking at this Cincinnati team last year, so exciting going forward. Question marks in defence. Matt Miazga comes in. They start to improve. They've added Mosquera in the um, uh, in the uh, winter transfer window. And they look to have built that. And now they, they, their attack is still very good, but not at the levels of last year. But their defense is so so much better that they really nullified such a free-flowing Seattle attack from these last few games. Yeah, especially in this game, they kind of kept Seattle at bay. They had a lot of blocked shots, didn't allow them a whole lot of really menacing chances inside mm. the box. And I, I was very impressed with how tight their defense was able to hold and, and keep Seattle from really pressuring too deep. Mm. Yeah, they it's 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 really um intriguing to see for their sort of performances going forward for the rest of the season how that they can manage a game quite well when it's not that they're entering shootouts and having to like right we need to get these two goals to get ahead we need to be making sure that we're making these chances count they can create a little bit more patiently than they did last year and not everything is on a quick transition and quick get it into Acosta the movement of Brenner and Vasquez quick let's make the most of this they're, they're a little bit more of a consistent build-up maybe and a, a more articulate maybe <laughs> And that's kind of how they scored their goal in this game, where mm. it was a, it was kind of a quick build up, but then they held the ball back and they kept the pace of play and they, they kind of didn't let Seattle get comfortable, but they also made sure to kind of pick and choose how they were going to shoot. And Brenner finishing that speaks to how key he's going to be now that they were able to keep him and have him, you know, return to practice and get back in, in mentally in form with the mm. team. That's going to be huge for them going forward. And especially how they scored against Seattle this weekend. Yeah, and from the Seattle side, obviously, um, Ever unavailable through injury this weekend, and Freddie Montero got the start. I think mean, this sort of highlights how important having a player like Ever or getting Raul Ruiz Diaz um, fit again, how having that central striker, that sent center forward, that number nine in the box, who not so much just for them finishing, but also for the movements of uh, Roldan and Morris and the, how the whole attack is being built. It just seemed a little bit like it was missing a part. Yeah, they definitely seemed like they were they weren't gelling as well as they had been, and I think I I credit that more to um you know more to those match fitness than I do any talent level that they have. Mm. Seattle Seattle is going to be near the top of the table for all for the season, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. No, I think they've <clears throat> they had a relatively um soft couple of games to start the uh, especially from the performances of uh, Colorado and uh, Sporting KC. So it, it's come up against a 
very difficult, well-organized side, and it will just maybe be a little bit of a refresher and a little kick to remind them, right, okay, this is the level we need to be playing at. We can't, uh, <laughs> we can't expect every game to be like those first two. Um, let's go across to uh, last year's MLS Cup runners-up, Philadelphia Union. They scraped through against Chicago after uh, their weekend, um, uh, after their week, sorry, in uh, CCL. And Chicago really stifled Philadelphia for long periods of that uh, game at the sending off really um, took its toll. And Philadelphia finally got that way through. And it's it's just a, a valuable uh, a valuable three points for Philadelphia, really, isn't it, Alex, that they've they were able to make those rotations and still just just get out of this game with a win. Yeah, and I think Philadelphia, I think they'll be okay in the long run. Obviously, that loss against um, Inner Miami was not um, ideal for them, but like you mentioned, they're in CONCACAF Champions League and, and they're going to be, you know, leagues up coming up uh, later in the year and all these competitions that, you know, again, I stress MLS rosters are not, I, I don't know. They just need a way for them to bolster these rosters so players don't get injured and there's just overloads of injury and mm. that's my biggest concern. But yeah, I think, this was a crazy game, you know. There's a red card, and you <laughs> yeah. know, yeah, Philly always, you know, they're a great team, but they always, you know, they get chippy sometimes, and I guess that's the nature of you know Philadelphia as a city. But yeah, a crazy game. Uh, Walking Torres scoring that winner in the 90th minute, you yeah. know, two red cards. You know, just, <laughs> I'm just like like Chicago, you know, decimated. You know what? What they had like nine players left on the field after. I don't know, but yeah, it was just a crazy game, and two players getting sent off, and. Yeah, I don't know, like Chicago, like uh, for me, I expected them to be a little bit better than, you know, uh, mm. I, I feel I just with Shakiri, he, he is a good player, but I feel like sometimes like, I don't know, is that, you know, a guy you really build around without like ha him having someone else next to him to, you know, kind of shoulder that load. And yeah, mm. it, it, it was just a wild game. I have no words, you know, Philly's going to do what they do. And, you know, they're a really great team. And I'm still shocked that you know, Miami was able to beat them, you know, uh, the, what was it, a week and a half ago, but yeah. yeah, they'll get it together. And, and, you know, I, I don't doubt that they will be, you know, top of the East come at, at the end of the season as well, but yeah, just a crazy game. And I, I, I've got no words, like two red cards. Like that's, <laughs> yeah. That, they yeah. That's like, didn't handle what Philadelphia <laughs> were doing particularly well, I think, and no. they might manage the game better. And, I mean, you mentioned there Shakiri. I mean, I've grown up watch, like seeing him in his career in Europe be very inconsistent as a player, sometimes fantastic, sometimes just drifts for quite long periods out of games. And Chicago need him to be a regular, every week, consistent performer. And yeah, he may may be able to do some of those levels to a certain level uh, each week, but they, they're just not going to score goals with the way they're playing at the moment. And the forward line with uh, Shabilka up front isn't going to be a he's not going to get you uh, double digit goals um in this season kai kamara uh will work hard but suspended <laughs> already now it's, it's really like, i'm just not sure where they're going to get goals from and you can see that the defensively they'll be organized and they can they can start managing games better than they'll they'll get some results um but you just can't go into games expecting them to win it's going to be how how do they cope with how do they cope with the opposition more than how will they dictate the game which will be it will be a tough season for Ezra, Hedg Hedg oh, Ezra Hendrickson um going into year two um sticking in the conference Toronto and Columbus got a one-all draw um Columbus are growing under Wilfred Nance he's got plenty of op options uh Jeremy in his attack especially Kucho, Zeller Ryan um and he's getting players buying into a system that he's used in Montreal uh, it just didn't. It just doesn't seem to be clicking exactly right at the moment, and there's still some growing pains um, in the final third. But they they seem to do quite well up against the Toronto side, who you expected to be going forward and to be creating yep. chances. But with uh, they they seem to be better defensively than than when they started the season anyway. Yeah, you know, for for Columbus, you took the words right out of my mouth. It's the growing pains right now, mm -hmm. I think, and just the, these guys le learning how to gel together in this new system. I, I I was expected coming into the season that it was going to take some time, and it seems to be doing so. However, you know, anytime you can get a point on the road, uh, yep. especially north of the border, uh, not not a bad uh, not a bad result there. So you know, the crew are still a team that I'm I'm pretty high on uh, this season if they can put it all together. Um, I think they'll be a team that that you know caused some chaos and you know with this expanded playoff field could find themselves you know very much in that in that conversation i expect them to find themselves in that conversation 
uh, where, you know, on the other side, Toronto, you know, they're somebody, you know, some people have been pretty high on them. Some people are not so high on them. It seems to be a, a, a team that people can't quite figure out uh, how to predict yeah. so far this season. And a result against Columbus, a home draw against the Columbus team that's still trying to find its footing sort of, I think, kind of checks all those boxes of, mm. you know, what, what are we going to get with this Toronto team this season? You kind of thought they were going to take a step forward, but maybe, maybe they won't be able to find that other gear. I think time will tell. Yeah. The interesting side, like putting so much into this first 11 um, when the yes. players are missing, uh, what, what will you have? It's uh yeah. Curious team. Um, Matt, let's let's look across to Sporting KC nil, LA Galaxy nil, and it just looked like neither team had anything to uh, um to worry the other team in the final third, and it just was an inevitable nil nil after the game as the game progressed. Yeah, nobody really wanted to win this one, yeah. and I I was I was shocked that Kansas City played the way they did. They they came out and they had I think some absurd like thirty shots total, mm. and it they had the opportunities. The thing that surprised me is that they seemed jittery. They mm. they seemed like they weren't comfortable uh, in their attacking third. They just wanted to put the ball on net. They they were hoping to win by attrition almost, just hoping that they would eventually get something by. But none of their none of their shots, none of their attacks really had any bite to them. You know, mm -hmm. even uh, Tommy at one point had uh, an open lane on the left side and he pulled it wide. You know, they, yeah. they never really they never had any comfort or ability to get a menacing shot on goal. Yeah, they seem really affected by the, um, these first couple of games, like offensively. I mean, I think remembering correctly, they haven't scored yet this season. And nope. Yep. And then, yeah, so they just it just looks like they're really just concerned and it's just please just get this one goal <laughs> and then things may yeah. start to get a bit of rhythm about them but they and they, they performed so well at the end of last season as well went on such a great run um I think it was the last eight games they only lost once um they had some of the best form that, towards the end of the season but it just as hasn't... they started to get healthy yeah and it just hasn't carried over unfortunately I think Johnny Russell being injured at the beginning of the season and that like, having taking time to get back into the side um Polito and Kinder not really back um still waiting for them to gain fitness so it's there's still question marks over what's going on there but on the Galaxy side they're relying on wide players who are slowing the game down they're they're not really affecting anything in the in the final third um they're not delivering the crosses quickly enough at times or they're cutting back in when they could go down the line and uh, you just and Ricky Pooch is there in the middle and it's we, he's we there in the middle. <laughs> yeah, he's there in the middle, but I, I was expecting more from him. And I think yeah. uh, with, with the new contract, especially the, the team needs more from him. And mm. until until he's able to affect the, the pace of play better, um, they're they're going to continue to struggle. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be an interesting team. And with the um, the uh, the ban on um, the transfers from um, abroad in the summer, I mean, they've, they're bringing in a couple of uh, fullbacks, it looks like, um, from South America. But they're not affect. They're not making any real big deals in the uh, in the final third or these wide areas. So it looks like Memo Rodriguez um, is going to um, play regularly. Uh, Douglas Costa and Tyler Boyd. We'll see how he gets um, gets himself sorted. But it, it just it's there's just big question marks about what they're doing um, with their roster in that in the in the attacking third. Yeah, and that has to be the biggest concern is that what you're seeing now is the team they're going to have to ride or die with. And yeah. the, the transfer ban just means that w they have no time. They have, I think, less than a month or so to get their team ready for not just the, the summer heat, but the stretch playoff run. And, and if they can't do that now, then it's going to be a long season for them and their fans. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does look so. And um, uh, Jeremy, let's go up to uh, RSL and Austin, another West Coast game, a Western Conference game. Um Austin really did bounce back after a horrendous um, CCL week. Um, the couple of uh, fantastic Galazzos, um, really, to uh, to win the game. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Gallagher, the fullback, smashing him with his left foot. Owen Wolf, um, uh, Wolf, sorry, getting space in the midfield, finishing from outside the box as well. And uh, we talk about how our um, the Galaxy need to improve their roster, and they look to need to improve forward. Mastroni and RSL was just saying, I don't have that central midfielder that's going to control a game. I don't have that central midfielder that's going to win the ball. And we saw so much of Austin just being able to play the ball around and RSL just didn't have that aggressiveness that um, maybe they're more known for. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the tempo was just dictated by Austin the mm. the entire time. And you finally saw them able to get comfortable in what they were doing and and find some organization and find some intentionality in their in their attack and the way they were playing that maybe we haven't seen so far in this season. Um, I think a lot of that was due to RSL, just sort of handing them the ball and letting it, yeah. letting it happen. But um, you do got to give Austin some credit. Again, the goals by Gallagher and Wolf were, were both very, very impressive. And, um, you know, I think Josh Wolf called it after the game a a, a massive win or something to to that effect. <laughs> um, I don't know against this RSL team a, a win against them would be considered massive, but I do think it's massive for just getting things going back in the right direction yeah. uh, for the Verde uh, because obviously there are a lot of question marks, especially defensively for this team, and and you know well deserved question marks mm-hmm. um, you know over these first few matches. Um, we'll see if this is just sort of a one off you know, thing against an inferior opponent and they continue to struggle or if they can actually get things back on track. I don't necessarily think those center back issues have been alleviated no. by any, uh, <laughs> any stretch of the imagination. So we'll have to see if they can make it work against better competition. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's, um, and we'll have to see uh, who they end up playing uh, in CCL, how many players do arrive yeah. um, oh for their gosh, second yes. leg game. <laughs> that, would be, that would be wild to, to lose that big in the, in the first leg and then somehow go through on forfeit. That would yeah. that'd be pretty unfortunate. <laughs> uh, two more games left. So uh, Alex, RS, uh, Nashville, um, get a 2-0 win against Montreal. Um, um, Hani Mukto started uh, started this one, and he's got Schaffelberg and Pico on the uh, either side of him, and it looks like they've really built this team. They may not have brought in the stars; they don't really have that centre forward that you can rely on. But they've really taken a bit of pressure off um, Hani Mukta going forward now with some quick um, and really decisive runners either side of him that are getting the best out of this team going forward. Yeah, and um, you know. Looking at Montreal, you know, look how far they've fallen. You know, yeah. I don't think they've won a they've they I don't think they've won a game yet. It's no, three, three games in, and yeah. yeah, three losses, three games, three losses, and yeah, I think uh, I don't I don't know, like you know, they're gonna fall, they're they're falling hard. You know, they lost a lot of their players. You know, Kone, uh, Mihailovic, you know, um, Alistair Johnson. They all they all left and kind mm. of gutted their core. And you know, I feel kind of bad for Hernan Lasada, who you know is a decent coach and you know there's plenty of talent on this roster but what the, they only have one dp spot filled with victor wanyama and that's you know i don't think that's going to be enough for them they maybe need to go out and get a you know an attacking midfielder or a, or a central striker or, or or just someone to to help him out because it, it's it's you know it's, it's yeah it's i'm just at an all because last year we all saw how good montreal was mm-hmm. and they were a very good very good phys- physical team and the well coach and wilford nancy you know, did miracles with, with that that squad, and they were very enjoyable to watch. And you know, it's it's unfortunate to see them gutted this you know this poorly. Obviously, uh, you know the owner you know should do more, and uh, you know he's kind of notorious for not spending yeah. on the uh, <laughs> not not the Montreal deck. CF Montreal, it's yeah. still a bad habit of mine. <laughs> but um, yeah, going back to Nashville, they you know they you know they they're like the anti Inter Miami. They did it the right way, and and yeah. the, the roster is just smartly built, and and they drafted the right guys like Jack Mayer, a brilliant center back pairing next to Walker Zimmerman, who's also a very good center back. They've got you know uh, during this game they they played with a double pivot of McCarthy and uh, uh, Sean Davis, and you know Sean Davis was an excellent uh, free agent yeah. addition that they did, and you know like you said Mokhtar, he's got runners now, so he doesn't have to hard carry the offense and. You know, Till Bonberry is a you know decent stop gap. Maybe they go out and uh, I don't know. I don't know if their deep. I think their DP spots are filled because Ake Lobo went off. The yeah, he's still. Count, so. Yeah, still counts. So, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Like the uh, Miami had that with Pizarro last season, so they can mm. really go out and and do that. But yeah, they they they've got a really well rounded squad and uh, Chapelberg and Papa Picol, uh, uh, um on the wings. They have runners and you know Shaq Moore and and Dan Lovitz on the other side of them, other side of them, uh, and, and as a fullback, you know. They've got a good squad and you know mm. i think nashville will, will, will be you know i don't know i don't know if this is too soon but i think they'll be in contentional for like top five maybe yeah, yeah i think they'll, they'll finish the high in the east as well so um yeah lots of fun nashville uh you know the fans are great you know their stadium's uh incredible and um you know gary smith doing what you know he does best i guess i know a lot of fans may not like gary uh, national fans they do have some issues with gary smith sometimes that he has in tendency to park the bus but you know the season they've been going for it and attacking and uh, that should be a, a positive sign if you're an Asheville fan to 
you know, you know, hope for the future, uh, you know, because, you know, compared to some of the other games that they've played, you know, just kind of bunker down and encounter with Mukhtar, mm. you, know, you know, hoping and praying that he scores, um, you know, obviously they would like to you know, to see what Nashville is doing now with them going forward with wingers and, and that solid spine of the double pivot behind Hani Mukhtar. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. Montreal is tough. I mean, they, they're using young players like Sean Rea um, coming in, but not every young player is going to have the impact Ishmael Kone had <laughs> coming yeah. straight in um, from their side. Last one was uh, San Jose 1, Colorado 0. Um, Espinosa getting a goal. He's only three three assists off um, Shea Salinas uh, to be the record assist provider. Um, so it's, they seem to be um, kicking off quite well. Um, Luchi Gonzalez is getting quite a good song out of this uh out of his players colorado though um the goal um espinoza shot uh, it's just they, they were slow to close down they, they just don't seem to be really on the uh, at the level they they'd have hoped to be at i think now and but there's this there's, there's signs of something good with uh darren yappy up front the young young forward seems to be um finding his feet just needs to try and get that first goal to maybe bring a little bit more confidence and a bit more composure uh in that final third uh, but that's week three. Um, it's an exciting, exciting week once again. Um, Jeremy, Matt, uh, Alex, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for all your input, and um, look forward to uh, speaking to you guys all again soon. Thanks, Mike. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Thanks for the time.